Our chat subject today is Mr. Bob Rastas. Welcome and welcome to the chats. G'day, Doug. Lovely to see you. Lovely to catch up to you face to face. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit about your early years because you were a military brat. I was indeed. In fact, I've just returned yesterday from a trip to Singapore and Malaysia, revisiting <coughs> a lot of my childhood. Um, while things have changed a lot in 45 years, um, I think that going back, there are elements of familiarity and everything that that were there from mm -hmm. smells to the fruits to the food to the but going back to my my childhood homes and and getting those real pangs of memory um, reminded me that I was very very fortunate to be brought up that way um, one of the discussions I had with someone was that I don't actually understand racism while mm -hmm. I know what it is I don't intrinsically in myself understand what it is to dislike someone or hate someone just because of their skin color color creed or whatever yeah which i think is a blessing for me um, my best little friend when i when i was um, you know, seven or eight was a chinese lad and of course had i known what i know now um the chinese at that time were the lower echelon within singapore so i i very much am, am fortunate to do that i'm very much fortunate to have moved around a bit and to be exposed to different cultures and I think it's just made me a far more open individual and I'm, I'm grateful for it, albeit that it was very difficult at the time moving regularly. Why did you allow 45 years to go by before returning there? I, <coughs> in the last week I've been questioning that and I think it's just that life gets in the way. Mm. Um, I've wanted to go back and, and the main driver uh, for that was that my... my um, my wife has never travelled into into Asia, and we're planning to go to Morocco next year. Um, so I wanted to introduce her into other parts, particularly some parts of a country that's not third world. But mm. we'll mm. we'll eliminate some of the culture shock that you you get from going through the likes of Turkey and and, um, mm -hmm. and Morocco and India. So that was the driver for now. But why did I take so long? I think life just gets in the way between <coughs> having a career. Um, it just, finding that eight hours to jump on a plane to go across there and come back was difficult. But if I'm to lament, I probably should have done it 20 or 30 years ago. How did, did you find your, your previous um, home places? Um, well, they both exist, which is okay. unusual. Uh, one in a very, very <coughs> busy part of uh, Serangoon Gardens. Uh, while the privacy fencing is not there, the house is it, still, oh. even at four years of age, I have very strong memories of that. Okay. Um, but the other house where I was ages seven through nine, um, very, very, it has not changed. A, a thing has not changed on the house except for air conditioning units on the ah. other side. <laughs> uh, so modernisation there. Um, the other side of the road, however, where there were a couple of houses, used to be all rubber plantation. And oh. then down the end of the road was a kampong, which is a, um, a, a village, if you like. Okay. There are no kampongs left in Singapore. It's now all high-rise high accommodation. So that has changed. And the big thing for me is the old monsoon drains, which are very, very big drains to carry rainwater away. They're all pretty much covered up now. So that area, don't play in the monsoon drains because you'll die. Um, isn't a problem, but it's wow. still, wow. it was, it was remarkable to go back. My biggest thing that I take is standing there to take photos of the house was the, the fence that I thought was 10 foot tall is only five foot tall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there be the difference in height. Well, you were also a Navy sailor. Tell us about what the Navy taught you. I joined the Navy as a boy sailor, basically as an apprentice. Um, my life in the Navy was not good. Um, I've since worked out that what happened to me in the Navy essentially was sexual assault. Um, but at the time, I was a willing participant in it. So I think that's one of the reasons why consent for me is such a huge thing. Um, I wasn't actually at a time in my life where I could have given informed consent. I was actually being manipulated by older people, um, male and female. Um, but at the time, I was a willing participant. But that's where the difference in power comes from. And that's why I have such a, an interest these days, I think, now in, in what power exchange really is and whether that consent can be informed and willingly given to participate. Um, it made me grow up very, very quickly. And I became far more worldly than I thought 
well, I realised I became far more worldly uh, through that experience. I don't regret it, but it wasn't nice. And I now have a business which makes um, um, wall-mounted plaques for Navy ships and their crests oh, and whatnot. Oh. I share that business okay. with um, um, a very dear friend of mine and his spouse and, and uh, my wife. And um, the thing that I love most about it is getting in touch. When older sailors get in touch, we can have a talk. And a big part of what we do is not just making stuff, but connecting and helping people with their honours and awards or finding advocacy for their veterans affairs claims and things like that. That's an added benefit. But um, I think that time in the Navy... Hmm. It is troubling to think back on it, but I think back on it also with a degree of fondness. But I had no desire to ever connect back with Navy again, but my business has caused that to occur, and I'm really enjoying that. Do you care to fill in the audience a little bit about what happened? You, you've alluded oh, to it, but haven't look, actually said um, <coughs> I, I joined. I joined just, uh, just after my 16th birthday. You cannot join the Navy at that age anymore. The, um, the conventions around child, um, child soldiers now prevents junior recruits and apprentices at that age. But... Um, Basically, offers were being made for physical uh, relief and arousal and, you know, God, I'd fuck anything that moved. If it didn't move, I'd kick it. You know? so, but male, female, it really didn't matter at that time, albeit that you know, it was very, very hidden. Um, and there was an awful, looking back, there was an awful lot of manipulation. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, it was, hey, someone likes me. Um, so, yeah, it was very much physical. It was very much um, getting involved in, in uh, sexual contact, sexuality. Um, um, I, I, yeah. Uh, it's pretty hard to, 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 to put things back into place there, but it was mm. anything went. Um, okay. I think it was the first time that I, in any manner, shape or form, experienced being bound. Oh, okay. Um, and I did enjoy that in my mind, but I look back on it and wonder what I was enjoying. Oh, so, um, okay. So, yeah, a bit, bit wary on that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's what went on. And, and uh, yeah, there, there was quite an age difference and, and more to the point, there were some rank differences too. So sure. very much inappropriate behaviour. As I said, had I been presented with the same thing at the same age with what I knew, I'd still be involved. Okay. You know, it, but it's only with the benefit of hindsight to work out that it was a manipulation and that consent couldn't actually be gleaned. Got it. Mm. I'd like to take a step back and mm. explore the concept of racism with you because when we prepared for this chat, that was a very strong topic for you. Mm. And you've alluded to it, having just revisited Singapore and Malaysia. Yeah. Tell, talk with us more about that. Um, <clears throat> I, don't, I genuinely do not have in me the ability to dislike someone just because of where they come from, what they believe in. It, it, it just isn't within me. And I think part of that was that this ready acceptance of everything that was going on around me. Mm. As we were driving down one of the <clears throat> highways, there was a, a rather large... Uh, in, in one of the religions in, in Singapore, funerals are very bright, very colourful, very yes. noisy. Yes. And when they're in the <clears throat> funeral procession, there, there's noises and cymbals and drums and people waving flags and banners and it's to scare the evil spirits off. Oh, I see. Um, mm. And the... The, the castle <clears throat> is there, and they're multi-story hearses, not like we're used to of the somber, dark. Oh. Hmm. Um, when you're exposed to things like that, and you accept it as being, oh, this is what happens, all right. Um, being woken in the morning for the call to prayer. Yeah. Um, uh, probably one of the first monogreens I ever heard was white bum being what my ear was hearing in, in that particular call to prayer. And all of us kids called it white bum. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. What, what does that mean? Well, I don't yeah. know, but the words in, in, in the language of call to prayer um, sounded like white bum to me. Oh. And it probably oh. was um, uh, alakum, 
or something like oh, that. Um, okay. uh, so we, we, we just accept this as what it is and accepting the fruit of the, the food, the food, the people, um, the fact that, that someone will at some point in time in a park lay a mat down and, and then bow in a direction. I worked out where Mecca was way before anyone else did. Uh-huh. Um, because of the orientation of where people were facing to pray, not because of their religion. Now I'm I'm essentially not religious. I I don't commit to any form of religion apart from being nice to one another, uh, <laughs> or nasty when people ask for it appropriately. <laughs> um, but it's one of those things where, when you're exposed at a young age, and particularly with the only thing I really had an issue with were New Zealanders because of the rugby. And it was a sport-related thing because all of the adults around me were really getting upset about what was going on at the rugby when we were playing the Kiwis. Mm. And I think that was the only time I really looked at anything from a nation or a country point of view to go, well, there's a bit of conflict here. But anything else, it just it sits so well with me. So I struggle a lot. I'm, I, I, I admire people that are of a belief or have a religious belief or who have the ability to commit to an unknown so strongly that they... But then I struggle in the converse with that when they then decide to make their belief and try and force it on them. Yeah, yeah. So I struggle with that as well. Um, but acceptance of people as who they are. If they're an asshole, I'm not going to like you. I don't care what colour creed or whatever. But if you're nice... Again, I don't care you who yeah. you are. Yeah. So I yeah. do enjoy that that freedom of it, and um, it applies to all aspects of life, not just race, not just religion, not colour, not creed, but sexuality, the lot. Yeah. I judge people on what I see and what I hear, and yeah. and even then I try not to be judgy wudgy about it. You know, it's one of those things where you yeah. just go. I try and understand what the motivation is for someone to behave like that. But that's only come in the last 10 years, really. Oh, I see. Yeah, I see. I've grown. You know, I, okay. I often imagine what it would be like to have what's in my head now at the age of 23 mm, or 24. Yeah. And I think it, my head would have exploded. <laughs> but now I've got the life experience to carry forward here and go, hmm, that's what's going on in their life. Maybe I shouldn't be reacting this way. But... If their behaviour is poor, I'll call them out on it as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's not appropriate to treat me like shit just because you're feeling bad. I'll let you know. And if you like that and you're good with that, then we'll become better friends. If you're not, well, you can go away. <laughs> you're not going to add value yeah. to my life. Yeah. So that, that's sort of where that whole issue of racism comes from or lack thereof. And um, bottom line, don't be an ass, and I won't be an ass. Sounds good to me. <laughs> but taking a step even further back, um, you had some very early BDSM exploration in your life. At yeah. one point, you tied a girl to a laundry pole. Tell us about that. Cowboys and Indians. Okay. You know, goody good guys, bad guys, whatever. But on this particular day, it was um, actually the... the um, the niece of our next door neighbours at the time. And we were playing something like Cowboys and Indians and I had a couple of skipping ropes and I tied her up to the post. And the the whole... You know the Penelope pit stop out of, of um, Wacky Races? Uh, yes. Ooh! Well, this was going on. And for some reason, I remember that really, really clearly. And I also remember that... And I must have been 12 or 13 prepubescent, pubescent thereabouts, and the feeling that I got out of that. Which was? I can't tell you apart from it was a feeling, and I, I'm not sure that I would say that it stirred my loins, but it probably did if I'm remembering that. Ah. But it, it really generated this this feeling of, um, of I like this. Okay. Um, possibly one of my first, my first emotional links into topping. My first emotional link into that applying control applying and we went on to to experiment with each other for a long time well, a long time at that time is probably a year mm. but truly one of those times that i i i remember that feeling of oh this is good <laughs> and um whatever good was at the time 
Okay. Whatever good was. And it, it was very, very powerful. I still remember the day. I still remember the, the furniture that was there, the outdoor setting, where she was, that it was um, middle of the morning and possibly even how the sun fell across her face and her body. In wow. Her mind. That's wow. how powerful that moment was. Um, so I, it keyed into something that existed in me already, I'm sure. How did she take all of this? Well, she didn't object. Um, she was more than happy to be tied up again in the future. I've never seen her again. Oh, wow. Okay. After that, that particular <clears throat> period of time of living there. Um, but there was never any distress on her part apart from apparent foe. And, um, and she would all... Um, Somehow, I think she manipulated the circumstances to be in that position. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe my first experience of topping from the bottom. Who knows? <laughs> but you've said your journey into kink was a, a series of happy accidents. What, what do you mean by that? I, um, after I left the Navy, and I left the Navy as a, as a result of an accident where I was struck by a car and um, discharged... Um, medically unfit I then started working in sales because that's all a bloke gets at a young age and um, and I had a a happy coincidence where I met a lady who was, I think was 24 or 26 or roughly at the time who decided that I was her toy now of course I didn't mind this okay um, I didn't mind it on the basis that it was very much consensual that she was teaching me, that she was being very direct in what she wanted and I was learning from it. And then she started broaching the subject around some of the different things, including aspects that I now recognise being very much BDSM, being very much leather, being very much okay. um, that formal submission dominance deal. And then she took me to a party. Okay. I walked into this place. I would never have found this without her. Um, well, never have found it at the time without her because um, this was early 80s. Okay. <coughs> About the only way you found this world at that time was from word of mouth. And I wasn't worldly enough to know what to ask for. But she got it. She took me there. And I went into this place and it was full of people engaging in these really amazing things and not sexual but there were people on crosses there uh, were people bound and tied up uh, there was a, a, hum, a bit of human furniture in the corner which I sat there and watched with amazement as for an hour this bottom had a, a tabletop on their back and people were taking drinks from them and I could only imagine how the knees must have been killing me. Do you know, I can't even remember if they were a male or female. But walking into this place, my senses were overloaded. And then um, she took me in there and put me on a cross and just gently played with it and said, can you do that? I can do that. Showed me how to do some things. And then we started playing, you know, in a way that became fairly intense very, very quickly. Oh. Actually, let me change it. It became very intense, very, very quickly, and opened the door to the world of, of BDSM. More to the point, it opened up that part of me that was really struggling to come out, uh -huh. and that was Bob, dominant Bob. Bob, who, who had a need to be a sadist. Who, mm. And at the time, I'm, here I am as a young Ambo, young ambulance officer who the dichotomy in my mind you go out and help people yet in your pleasure you want to hurt people but the big difference is of course with that idea of I've only ever hurt, some, hurt someone in play that ever wanted to be hurt yeah yeah. and that is the difference um, yeah. there is only one instance where I have uh, ever inflicted pain upon someone who didn't ask for it and it was in my work as an ambo it was someone who bullied me terribly at school and I hurt them badly 
<sighs> I still feel guilty about that. I still understand why I did it, but the look on his face as I stuck my thumb into an open wound and caused him some pain. Oh. I still remember the look mm. and that look of fear that was in his face, and I never ever want to visit that again. And it's only in the last three or four years that I've actually put that to bed a bit, so I can talk about okay. that. Okay, okay. So there are these things that have happened in my life which have reinforced what my, what my BDSM life is um, around, again, consent, around um, not doing harm. Yes. I'm regarded very much as an edge player. I do play on edge. I do work really out there at the things that find quite, people find quite squeamish. Um, I don't play publicly anymore because of where I work and what I do. But one of the big public plays was a breast skewering, which was, for this part of the world, pretty intense. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, that I'm as much a performer as I am a, um, um, a dominant as a sadist or whatever. Uh, and I love that, but I can't go back there anymore, not with what I do for a living not the, the, the role that I hold in, in my job now. You mean publicly? Publicly, Okay, yeah. yeah. Privately, hell, we're Oh, there. sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but even then, you know, I, I went through a, a, a period of time where my play was getting more and more extreme. I, blood is, is something I, I, I love, blood. The, mm. I, had a, a, I had someone come up to me one day and said, hey, Bob, I want to get castrated. I, I really want to do that. Oh, yeah, okay. And I went home and I opened the, the, the um, anatomy and physio physiology, uh, physiology books, my other reference materials, and as I'm doing this, I'm going, what the fuck are you thinking? It was at that point in time where I go, I think you're now about to cross a line, don't do this. So I didn't. I went back to this particular fella and, and said, look, this is not something I can do. I can do it, but I'm not going to do it. And yeah. the reason why is, but I do know a GP that I'd love to refer you to to get you to go and see and talk about this because I think that they can help you. And over a period of the next year or so, through that GP, through some psychological work and a surgeon, they end up getting done what needed to be done for this guy. But I was that close to crossing that line and, and, and doing this because it's not hard. God, I've castrated more sheep than I care to remember. I've castrated more cattle than I care. It's not hard, except I wouldn't reach down with my teeth. Yeah, yeah. But it's not a hard thing to do, but it's the wrong thing to do. Yeah. And without knowing where this particular person was psychologically, how could I do that without potentially doing harm? Yeah. So put them on the pathway, the right pathway. So, yeah, it, it's, you get so embedded in, in what you're doing and, and so full of yourself at times about what you potentially can do and what you can, and how far you can push this thing. And I'm really, really fortunate that something in my mind went, click, no, this is the point you need to stop. So I backed off and stayed out of doing anything for six months. Oh wow! To try and wow. re, to try and recalibrate. Okay. Um, okay. And then you get to the point in time where you just got to do it again, and and I'm really fortunate. I've been able to do that. So there've been. I got into the scene by accident through the guidance of a a, a lady. Um, I then have continued through. I was out of it for a while, and we got back into it again back in the in the late eighties, early nineties. And, but it's always been around this core part of me that is, is primarily a sadist, a control sadist. I've never ever let the inner being run free because I'm worried about what that could mean. But I also have just recently recommenced um, um, a dominant submissive relationship with uh, another person. Um, and I'm very, very comfortable in that now. We have a, a delightful relationship that is developing slowly. I think the one thing that I've learned in the last decade is that going in boots and all is often counterintuitive to what it means in the long run. 
and to develop those relationships. Um, in particular, making sure that my prime relationship is is nurtured and cared for and looked sure. after. Sure. Sure. That <coughs> that um, that you get far better outcomes in the long run. What is it about blood? that so interests you? Because your, your entire demeanor changes when you discuss that topic. It's, it, it's a visceral re reaction for me. Um, I don't, in my work, I, I don't get that. But in play, I get it. That, that um, when I'm blood bonded with someone mm -hmm. and I can play with blood with my bare hands and there is nothing like that sensation for me, that sensation of, of the slipperiness of the blood as it starts to congeal and then how it becomes a little more sticky and how the residual stays with your fingers or on your hands or on your arm. And particularly when I sign, I sign my name in blood on my play partners, just with my R, complete with serifs because it's important. Um, <laughs> but there is this thing about that thing that keeps you alive that I can play with. When... When mm -hmm. I get involved in a bloodletting, I, I can get someone to bleed whichever way I want to, whether it's through multiple pinpricks, whether it's from a cannulation, whether it's from whatever, where the blood can start to flow. As soon as I watch that first trickle of blood down the skin, that's when something in me just goes, mm. it is visceral. And the smell of it. And it is the smell that that reacts somewhere within my deep part of my, my, my million part of my brain that reacts there. Um, smell is one of those big things. I don't know where it came from to start with, but it just does it for me. And um, I'm fortunate enough to have a number of regular play partners that, um, that do adore blood play from the bottom side, which where I can, I can feed that part of me. So it is very much a, I don't know where it came from. I don't care where it came from, but I love it. Wow. Okay. That's a bit intense, I think. Um, <laughs> my first lessons at ambulance school when I first started was from a, a, an, old, an older gentleman whose name will, I'll keep private. He stood at the front of the classroom. Gentlemen, it isn't that hard because there were no women in ambulance back in that day. Yeah. It isn't that hard. Blood goes round and round. Air goes in and out. Consciousness is a good thing. Any variation on the above, do something. <laughs> and you know what? It hasn't changed. It, it's exactly the same today except we have all these lovely toys and drugs to play with. But the whole idea of blood dripping out not being controlled that's the lifeblood, <laughs> lifeblood, mm, yeah, there mm, you go. Mm. Um, that is life. And when I can then make an incision and watch that blood trickle out and I can make that happen, I can make it stop. Um, there is something really deeply primal about that with me. Yeah. And when that happens, there is this, um, this deep thing within me that I feel at my core. Wow. And um, I gotta say, giving blood can be an experience. Just watching this blood trickle down the tube into the bag, it's really um, just does my head a nice little thing. I don't mind sitting there watching my blood pour into a bag. Oh, so, my. Okay. Mm. Well, so you're looking a little pale. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> I, let's move on to another topic before I pass out. You my gosh. The question. My <laughs> gosh. Yeah, I, to give you some concept, I, I can't even watch the American soap opera General Hospital oh. without passing out. So, yeah. We should stop. Yeah, <laughs> as, as fascinating as is your topic, I need to move on. Please. So <clears throat> you lived in a town called Toowoomba? Toowoomba. Toowoomba. Yeah. And I, you told me that was the largest recipient of porno from the Eros Foundation. Oh. Tell us about that. What is that? Toowoomba... Um if there is a Bible belt in, 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 in Australia, Toowoomba is its buckle. Okay. Um, there are more churches per head of population, in particular more churches of a charismatic style. Um, um, it, it is this 
town about 80 miles, 100, 120 kilometers to the west of us on the top of a range. Okay. Um, it's like a wagon wheel for everything else. Everyone goes to Toowoomba and then out to points. Oh, I east, see. East, west, north, south. Mm-hmm. Um, it considers itself very much a a uh, country town trying to be a big city and has been like that ever since I was there. It... Um, It speaks with purity. It speaks with with on the outside, but you scratch the surface. Swinging is big, but back in the eighties, when pornography was being sent, video magazine was being sent out of the Australian Capital Territory. The Eros Foundation at the time was doing a survey on the suburbs or the the postcodes that were getting the most porn. Okay. And Toowoomba topped it out. Why, why was ago. that? Oh. I think you scratch the surface under any any strongly dominated. Um, um, I'm being. I'm trying not to use the word religious, but I'll, I'll use it for the moment. But that you're going to find that there are subcultures within that, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, you know, being the hub of of the Darling Downs, it, it clearly helped out with that postcode, but it also was one of the when you scratch the surface of Toowoomba you would find swingers everywhere my gosh once I understood the BDSM scene that was pretty powerful up there at the time wow and a big part of that I think also is because it was a uh, a provincial town that had a lot of public sector of public servants um, people in careers that posted in and out every couple of years you know okay. yeah. um, where there was this change of of population um I think that's why, but also there was a high degree of sick fuckery in Toowoomba. Ah. Um, <laughs> uh, I some of my best parties I've been to have been up in that neck of the woods. My gosh! Yeah, yeah. but you also said the first time you saw a sub offer uh, submission was was profound oh. for you. Talk with us about that. Um. The particular couple were very much, um, I found out afterwards, were very much um, part of the Gorean style of, of BDSM. And to watch this this lady who, who I saw as a very, very powerful, strong woman um, wander up to her Sir Neil place herself in a very, very clearly difficult position, head down, palms open, and just wait. And then him... Actually, I watched him as much. I watched him glance down and saw what she was doing and then deliberately not acknowledge her for a period of time. And then turned and acknowledged her, picked her up, used her hands to help her up, just gently kissed her on both cheeks, and then whispered in her ear and then off she wandered did something and came back then back on her knees and presented a glass of whatever he was drinking oh yeah oh yeah that for me that was like oh what am I missing here what have I missed here uh-huh. and it started me thinking more around rather than just the sadistic Bob to the dominant Bob to and yeah, it was a, a change of pathway for me. I still love my sadism, and that is part of who I am, but dominance and submission is what I play with now in my mind, I live with. Um, I, I had a, a long term um, uh, girl for a long time, and she um, was looking for a permanent relationship. And of course, if you're um, looking for a, a permanent relationship with someone, and you go, Oh, by the way, I got this sir on the side who's. My, my master and I'm his slave and you're just going to have to live with that you know that it's not going to last long yeah, yeah. but we were together for five years and you know, hand in glove extreme play through to um, no, I still love her dearly she's very much one of my best friends in my life and I hers um, and it was time you know when it's time it's time and part of it was she came out of a really broken, really difficult relationship. And, mm. and um, But 
for her to be strong enough to write me the most amazing email explaining that it was time to step away and why and, and acknowledgement of the care and love and um, I felt very privileged to be in a position to to be with her for that time you know I step, that part of no I, I was a bit broken by that oh, um, yeah. um, not because I didn't think it would continue the way it, it did I, it had to end at some point in time when she was ready to take on another life partner but it still hurt yeah only because mourning is, is part of, of that but I'm still remarkably happy for her to take the steps and I was only talking to her just on the way here today um, so we're still the best of friends I still love her dearly and um, um, it's taken 18 months to get back to a point where I wanted to establish another relationship and wow or um, well, probably two years and that's been going on for a little while and I'm very very happy with the, the relationship I have now because it's actually come from a position of, of um, very close friendship already mm. and I was a bit dumb really I didn't realize that she was looking I didn't realize I was looking and I happened to make a comment one day and she looked me in the eye and goes we need to talk so I was a bit clueless I think <laughs> interesting and, yeah and okay. I think serendipity smiles upon us when we when we're not looking and something presents itself you've got to grab it and go with it yeah yeah it's um just one of those things like, timing was right mm. well that vacillated a lot of different ways didn't it <laughs> mm. but you said you're a service top talk with us a bit about oh. that that was more tongue-in-cheek than anything else but oh, the more okay. i thought about it there there are times where i i play with people to facilitate their needs okay Bob, i need a really good beating okay all right, we set up the arrangement. We ha do the work we need to for negotiation. I beat someone because they want to be beaten. And, hey, I don't mind doing it. Ah, ah. But it's, it's where you have that lovely connection with people. And it's really... I've developed with maybe three or four people this beautiful play partner relationship, which is around fulfilling their needs but also scratching an itch that i might have as well so it's sure not it purely mm -hmm. selfless um but it is part of it is fulfilling a need of someone else before what it is for me and we actually have a group of friends that get together on a regular basis now for dinner or whatever which is god i need this can you help me out sure we have dinner and afterwards we do that it's like a but it's for that night, it will be for that person that night. Okay. Because very few of us are in that full-time relationship. Sure. And sure. it's lovely. It, it, it fills a need. and But part of it is, I got accused of being a service top one day. And I use accused. I felt really, what the fuck are you on about, you know? But then I thought about it for a while. And yeah, some of the play is really service topping. It's filling a need for someone else. Um albeit that I wouldn't play with someone unless I've got some sort of connection with them and that I'm going to get at least something out of it. Sure, sure. Um, otherwise, it, I'd expect cash, I think. Ah! Uh, Got to get something out of it, right? Do you, do you feel that there's, there's a huge demand for what you do? Oh, yeah. There are so many people out there that just need something. Um, uh my wife was telling me that at a dinner that she went to one night um, that one of the participants there the girl started playing with him and at the end of it he goes oh god I've needed that for so long and their response is well why the fuck didn't you say something huh okay oh I didn't think I could uh. so now we've made it okay in that particular group of people to go hey I really need this can you help Wow. Okay. Invariably, one of us can. But Very it's, good. that's out of a care, love and support of that particular group of people. So we... Yeah, there's got to be that connection. Um, I very rarely would play with anyone that I didn't know. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, it has happened and I don't feel fulfilled by it. Unless there's blood. <laughs> but what does protocol mean to you? 
Oh. Everything. Everything in 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 the relationship, it, it is absolutely everything. There are there are the rules that we establish, the rules that we set up. The um, I have an expectation that my submissive will, where possible, sit to my left, my wife's position to my right. Okay. Or where she chooses to be. If she wants to sit and left, that's cool because my wife is my prime. Yes. Um, and the submissive will fit into that, but the the very very gentle. Um, we were at a, a venue just recently and um, my girl sort of would you like something to drink I'd love an iced water thank you and she wanders off and grabs it and then comes back in a very very subtle and private way and just presented it to me that means more to me than her getting down on her knees uh, putting a big thing together uh, this, this, this appropriateness for situation yeah and not drawing focus away from someone else's scene, that sort of thing. Um, the the appropriate greeting, the appropriate um, recognition of of my primary prior to me. So when my girl comes in, my expectation is that she will greet Fiona, my wife, before she will greet me. Okay. Because we must provide that understanding that Fiona, this doesn't happen without my wife's say so sure if she doesn't concur with this if she's not in agreement with it it stops mm, mm, mm. because of that respect we have in our roles and our, 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 our relationship we've been married 30 years last week oh congratulations so, thank you um, so part of those rules and the things that we establish and protocol and I love leather protocols I love it. I think that there is something about the boots. There's something about the the position below me. There is something about all of that that works, which just keys into this desire of not so much wanting to be the boss, because that's naturally who I end up being, but about of someone that's making an effort to do what I I like. Oh, okay. Yeah. And what I need sometimes and recognition that I, you know I'm, a, I'm afflicted by the black dog you know depression and anxiety is part of who I am and part of my life and the nature of work that I do um, you know we all get scarred a little bit but I also believe a, a lot in, in um, emotional and psychological resilience and I also believe very very strongly in post-traumatic growth Oh, okay. In that when we are faced with crap and we deal with crap, that what happens after us and what we take on board with that sees us develop and build our resilience and build our prophylactically protect us for the future because we've seen it, which means that in the future we can handle that again better. Mm. Same thing applies, I think, in, in, in day-to-day life-to-life. We, we are only the sum of our own experiences, which means that we can handle things that happen to us now better. Just the same as you know what may have happened with a play partner 20 years ago. I'm never going to do again. I've learned from that. Right. So while I might be afflicted with anxiety and depression and it affects me far more regularly than I'd like, but does it outwardly affect me? Most people wouldn't know. My wife does when I go and get a tub of ice cream and want to eat it. Ugh. But my girl gets it. Okay. And as soon as she detects that, she switches on to something and will do something that just goes switch. And it might be just that she will sit at my feet. Oh, uh, okay. It might okay. be that she will, she will sit to my left side and she will just do something. Okay. Or she might place her hand, my hand around her throat something okay she's very very intuitive this lady she's very very clever she's very very smart and that to me is part of what protocol is i see part of what apart from the expected but the unexpected that you know pleases yes as i do things that please her but not in such a an obvious way this has been an interesting chat so far. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy with it. I'm 
I'm I'm saying more a lot more than I thought I would. Um, Fantastic! I'm, I'm I love really, it. Really, really comfortable with it, and uh, no, it's um, yeah, it's cool. But switching gears slightly, mm. when we were preparing for this, you mentioned the Fitzgerald inquiry. What was that? Tell us about that. Firstly, did you ever go searching for it? I have to admit, I did not, okay. and I'm guilty that <laughs> I'm guilty about that. I'm sorry. Um, we we have a, a series of television shows that have been in Australia recently called Underbelly. <clears throat> And mm-hmm. Underbelly's generally been about um, uh, real-life gangster types or real-life drug lords or that sort of thing. And there was one particular series that um, that actually was based on the, the history around the Fitzgerald Inquiry. Okay. Back in the late 80s, um, in fact, during the 1980s, we had a Premier in Queensland that was... Um, uh, an interesting person. He'd been the Premier for 30 years, so that's like a state governor, if you would think that way. Okay. Um, elected every three years or two years. Um, um, took the gerrymander that the, the opposition party had put into play and then created this amazing thing with boundaries that looked like peanuts or dumbbells to put two areas of population that would vote together for one seat and put four seats around it, so you end up... Mm-hmm. Uh, a, 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 a voting system that is never ever going to go the way of the opposition. Um, by way of disclosure, I am a member of um, uh, a political party, very much a, a left wing, or used to be left wing, now far more centrist political party around labour rights and that sort of thing. And the other side of it was um, the capital L liberal, not liberal as you would understand it, but very much a conservative side of politics. And um, I, I think probably the best way to describe it is that I would have been a Democrat in the US and um, the opposition would be Republican. Okay, yes. So that's probably the only way I could describe it. But during that time, um, there apparently were no brothels in Queensland. Okay. But you could drive down the street and see places with back doors open very clearly massage parlors. There were no illegal casinos. There were no, no, it was all very pure in Queensland, very much like the top of the range at Toowoomba. And through a process of a very, very brave journalist writing a story um, and then in turn, um, on a, in Australia, there's a, the ABC is the public broadcaster. They had a, a well, they have a show called Four Corners, which is a current affairs investigative journalism type of deal. Sort of 60 minute ish without the commercialism. Um, and he did a story called The Moonlight State. Okay. And it absolutely ripped apart the, the tenure of, of Queensland as far as what was being hidden. And then out of that, a very, very brave politician by the name of Mike Ahern, while the then Premier was overseas or something, um, created the Fitzgerald Inquiry, which... You read the first 80 pages of the Fitzgerald Inquiry, it sounds like an episode of Underbelly. Well, it was. But it was true. It was about brothels. It was about uh, gambling. It was about uh, murder. Uh, uh. It was about um, police taking kickbacks. It was okay. about a corrupt police force. It was about um, corrupt politicians. It, it was, And that investigation was huge. And it changed Queensland. In fact, in 1989, after the Fitzgerald Inquiry, it actually became legal for blokes to fuck. Ah. Uh. Before that, it was illegal. Okay. A dear, dear friend of mine um, touched up a, a lovely young thing and found out it was an undercover cop and he ended up being charged. Oh, boy. Um, so it was a pretty difficult time before that. Uh, home, there were no such thing as homosexuals in Queensland. Uh-huh. Heaven forbid that there might be lesbians out there. Uh, heaven forbid that people might actually have sex. Wow. Um, so very, very different. So the Fitzgerald Inquiry changed Queensland and... Um, you know, when, when that is all going on in your formative years and when you go and protest and then get put in the back of a police van and taken out in an alleyway and then beaten up, don't stay in town, you're going to get arrested next time. Well, I don't have a police record. Unfortunately, the bruises fade. But that's what was going on. Um, things are much better these days. And, of course, recently in Australia, you know, we, we now can have same-sex couples marrying. Uh-huh. And, uh, no, we had to fight long and hard for that. Yeah. Um, uh, I identify as queer because there's nothing fucking normal about me. So identify as queer. I, I actually, I, I march in our, our pride marches. 
in my uniform for work. Oh, wow. We've been doing that for a while. Yeah. And it's really important to me to be able to be me. To to not just be seen as Bob who's been married for 30 years, but Bob who's a bit different and just yeah. accept me for who I am. Yeah. And that wouldn't be happening today without Fitzgerald. So, big time in Queensland. But it's it was actually the, the, the start of change. The start of acceptance. The start of... Now, there were... There were people from churches throwing stones on at people in parades in Brisbane. Oh, it boy. Was same sex oh, parades. Oh, boy. So, yeah. So... Are we still in the dark ages? I think that there are large elements of Queensland that that would like to think that they'd take us back, but the the plebiscite into same sex marriage was really, really clear. Wow. And that is that more, way more people than not are accepting of live your life as you need to. Yeah. Tell us about online BDSM. Yeah. I think that um, people will denigrate Fifty Shades of Grey. Now, do I think it's a, a, a good piece of writing? Yeah. <laughs> no, I could write better. Did I write it? No, I didn't. Do I have an inkling to write anything better? No, I don't. So, am I going to hang, hang shit on someone that wrote some fanfic and got very, very popular? No, I'm not. But it's not what I read. I deliberately read as much as I could stomach of it. <laughs> uh, I deliberately watched the first Fifty Shades movie just so I could see what people were talking about. But then I got it. That's the end part of online, isn't it? We, we, we went from an underground society that I would not have found, this microcosm of community that I wouldn't have found without an invitation to it, or probably wouldn't have found it anywhere near as quick, to a point where... Once we start getting online, we've got this anonymity around uh, internet relay chat rooms, alt.com, all of the, the stuff that, that went on with the, 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 uh, the keyboard channels and bulletin boards and that sort of thing through to websites and that sort of thing. People found that, that BDSM became far more acceptable. Mm, yes. I think the feeling that I got was when I first emerged into the scene was that oh, there are other people like me. I'm not a freak. Yeah. For people to discover that online meant that we became far more accessible as a microcosm to to other people joining us. And, of course, that brings with it its dangers as much as its, of course. its doors. Yes. But I, the open door, the way in which it opened doors, um, hash BDSM and IRC was one of the most amazing things I enjoyed because there are people that I made friends with there that I hadn't laid eyes on in real life that I felt terribly afflicted by when they passed. Mm -hmm. That you end up meeting in real life. Mm -hmm. That they're still friendships that exist to this day, 20 years later. Um, but accessibility. It used to be that a, we were very fortunate in Brisbane. There was a club here called Club Libertine that was established. And um, it was a a premises set up as a theatre space. Okay. Um, and it had play equipment. You were invited in there by invitation only and you were vetted by the committee and all that sort of stuff. But the only way they could get get people coming in was to advertise in adult contact magazines. Uh, okay, yeah. Then the internet kicked off and then it became far more open and it became far more um, accessible. So the internet has been, meant accessibility it's also meant a bit more threat, potential harm. But as with anything, how many times do you know people that went on dates in, in the vanilla community that went back to someone's house not even knowing the name of the person they were bonking? Yeah, yeah. Whereas we had systems around for safe call. Because I'm going to go somewhere and get tied up and I need to make sure I'm not going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. well, in the vanilla world, what didn't we do? Yeah. And I think back to that time and go, ooh... 
Gee. Oh, I feel a bit icky about it. Um, icky, technical word. Yes, um, yes. But accessibility is a big thing. And also the ability to communicate and understand that within our world, our microcosm, that there are all these subcultures of BDSM out there yes. that people can readily find. Yes. And even if they become the one that started, there will always be someone else that will be able to join in with that. Sure. And in itself, I think that is, is good, but it also in itself becomes an issue around silos. Yes. Um, mm. So good things and bad things, but certainly that's where I'd, I'd be going with it. It's one of those things that um, um, I'm grateful for it being there. God, free porn. Yeah. What can you say? What advice do you have for newbies oh. in the community? While I understand the word newbies, I, I <clears> don't <throat> like it a lot because it, it it defines people as being it defines people. It's a label. But for people who are wanting to examine what this world is, my advice is to go to munches. Just get there where you don't, there's no expectation. Go and work out that the people who are dressed there, maybe like you, maybe like me, maybe in, in everyday street clothes, are not going to put the hard word on them, are not going to, um, you're going to be safe. Yeah. Go to munches, talk to people, get to know to people, um, but make the contact face to face rather than online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, too many times people come into harm's way when they there's no vetting. Face to face, you go to a munch, everyone knows everyone and they're going to make sure you're safe. I think that is my best bit of advice. I think also there are a number of books out <coughs> there that I would suggest that people read around the general works of, of BDSM. I still think Jay Wiseman's books carry a lot of weight as far as introduction. Okay. Uh, ethical slut. Really, really important thing to read um, if that's part of your world. But spend a bit of time getting a bit of knowledge and understanding and don't be afraid to ask questions, but right. know when to ask them. And then if you want to go to a party or want to go to a venue, get someone to take you who can be your guide. Mentorship is really important in this world. Yes. Um, and if you can find that right person who will lead you, guide you, help you, make sure you don't end up looking like a knobhead um, and therefore carry you through, that would be my advice is don't try and do it on your own. Get in touch with real people and eschew the bullshit that is online. Yeah. Because how do you tell the difference when you're new? You don't. Yeah. What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh. I genuinely don't know. Okay. I think people make an assumption that If people do not sit down and talk to me, they can make an assumption that I'm a big, bad sadist who just wants to hurt you. In fact, it's a, we're the furthest from the truth. I'm not going to play with you unless I know you. And to put it really, really simply, I think that there are people out there in the world that don't know me that think that I would never cry. Oh. And you couldn't be further from the truth. Today I've demonstrated points in time where I've become very close to them, become emotional. Mm. Um, tears are welled. But part of that is... is Bob being the Bob who carries with him a life of experience of some pretty shitty things or some pretty amazing things. And that at points in time when I'm discussing things that they will come to be part of who I am right now. Part of that 
post-traumatic growth deal that we spoke about earlier. Yes. But the fact that if you don't know me, you might make that assumption that I am just someone that just wants to hurt you. No. I see. Well, Bob Ross, just thank you for participating in an amazing fireside chat. I have, as I said before, I've been truly surprised of where you've taken me. We did prep for this. Yes. There are a number of these questions that I'm, I wasn't ready for, but I, I appreciate that. But it's given me pause for thought, and I thank you for that. My pleasure. Thank you.